Hey, it's Liberty, and today I want to talk about the various casting news that has been coming out over the last month or so. Um, I've been in India for two weeks, so time feels weird. The two punch of Netflix's Dorian Gray and Emerald Fennel's Wuthering Heights adaptation has the internet in an uproar, and I have a lot of thoughts about it. Is there a book that you want to see adapted? Is there a book that you are very scared to see adapted? I would love to know your thoughts. If you like this, do give it a thumbs up and I make videos all about books, history, culture, a lot of things. So do subscribe if you would like to. And if you'd like to buy me a cup of tea, the link is in the description. I'm just gonna get straight into it. So to start, I wanna talk a bit about media literacy. Now we talk about this a lot on the internet um, in the context of like disinformation and fake news. Media literacy is all about the ability to sort of analyse various media and the messages behind them. I'm going to direct you towards some books and articles I'm going to put in the description that talk a little bit more about this. But I will say our education systems, schools, universities are where we sort of first learn media literacy. If you think about taking English at school and conjure up images of like dog-eared and annotated versions of like Shakespeare plays, poetry books and novels. Um, the skills we learn in these classes really do kind of set us up for life in terms of like how to critically interact with texts. Let's face it, sometimes it does feel like you are just told the interpretation of something and you know have to regurgitate it in an exam but you do have to learn how to actually do that process for yourself. That process where like an outside authority is telling you something and you have to memorize it is called meaning matching. In meaning matching, meaning is assumed to reside outside the person in an authority such as a teacher, expert, dictionary, textbook or the like. The task for the person is to find those meanings and memorize them. Thus parents and the educational system are primarily responsible for housing the authoritative information and sharing it with the next generation. However, a key aspect of media literacy is not just to undertake meaning matching, but also to undertake meaning construction, where you sort of transform the message and create the meaning for yourself. Meaning construction is a process wherein people transform messages they take in and create meaning for themselves, is a dictionary definition. This obviously like requires some proficiency in meaning matching because to understand something, you sort of have to recognize the various phrases, meanings, themes, etc., to understand how they are being used. So we can't, we can't look down on meaning matching, but it, it's an important part of the process, but it's not the only part of the process. In his book, Theory of Media Literacy, A Cognitive Approach, the most fundamental of all barriers that hinder people from becoming more media literate is treating meaning construction problems as if they were simple meaning matching problems. When this happens, people think that there are correct convergent meanings that they need to learn. Because they have not learned them, they go to the media to find them. They look for news and accept the constructions offered by experts as the one and only meaning. It's not that you're either media literate or you're not, it's a scale. Um, a constant process that you're developing over time, there's always room for improvement. So why am I talking about this at all? Why is this relevant to book adaptations? So book to screen adaptations are hard to get right. In the last few years, there has been a move to modernize classics in various different ways with various degrees of success. Choosing what to include and how to include it in an adaptation speaks volumes about how producers and writers want audiences to interpret the story and what they deem to be important. Book narratives, especially like classics that have remained popular for hundreds of years, contain complex themes and subtext in addition to being an engaging story. It's how they've been so popular. What may seem to be small choices such as casting, costumes, set, design, all of that stuff can make all the difference in an interpretation of those stories. Writers make decisions for a reason and it is essential for all writers and producers and all those involved in the filmmaking process to have media literacy and to understand the choices that the original author has made in their books. If you can't do that, frankly, don't adapt the book. Go and write your own original story. Knowing how your choices affect the meaning of the narrative and analysing your choices, like why are you doing this? Is this, you know, is this important? Is this mean maybe giving a message that the author did not intend? Those should be crossing your mind. At the end of the day, your film lives and dies by its audience and making choices that will enrage a pretty much guaranteed audience, AKA fans of the books, probably not the best idea. Now I wanna have a chat about the two books that are under discussion. First up, Wuthering Heights. Controversy over Emerald Fennell's casting of Margot Robbie and Jacob Elordi has enraged people. And honestly, like including me as someone who thinks that Wuthering Heights is one of the best books ever written. So I wanna talk about some of the themes of the novel first and the 
first really obvious one is like culture versus nature, the wildness of the moor versus the like civility of the landed gentry and how that blurs and shifts. But then you've got also got dichotomy in terms of the characters with the more wild Earnshaws, your Cathy and your Heathcliff particularly, but then also with Wuthering Heights, the building on that side. And then you've also got the feelings of like passion and you know, unrestrained decision making and feelings and then on the other side you've got the Linton family thrush cross grange and you've got the civility and primness and politeness and manners. Next is revenge. Most of the decisions that Heathcliff makes in the novel are driven by revenge for the way that he was treated. He's so single-minded about it. He puts his own goals of revenge in front of like his own personal happiness that he could ever gain for himself. He gains pleasure from treating people badly and having having them still seek him out. Hindley specifically, like from his house to his son, Heathcliff's desire to take revenge on Hindley sees him treating Hindley's son the way he himself was treated and how he make him feel how he felt growing up in that house. This is something he actively chooses to do and he gets his revenge at the expense of the one thing he really wanted to be with Cathy, which he could never achieve until death. Next is obviously generational trauma, the repeating cycles you see across the different generations, the names are similar, the way, you know, they are acting like a younger versions of their parents. Kathy becomes more and more like her mother. You're supposed to see that same dynamic play out because the cycle is still ongoing. Next is arguably the most important for what I'm talking about and it is the commentary on the class system and how racism plays into that. Emily uses the class system as an example of how all of these characters are boxed into their lives and how no one is happy in this particular system. Heathcliff, and Kathy, who are our main characters, arguably Heathcliff is our, you know, main, the main character, they go the furthest outside of this system, with their relationship being a key example of that. However, Heathcliff and Kathy aren't seen as positively disrupting the system, but rather negatively as everything kind of goes back to the default at the end of the novel. And it is this kind of theme that makes the casting of Heathcliff so crucial. He's a cuckoo in the nest, essentially. He's someone who should not be there, he's a disruption to the class system, and yet he ends up in control of both great houses of the area. His expulsion from that system is what leads the rest of the characters to lead happy lives at the end of the book. Many of the negative ways that he is described in the book is because of the way he looks, and specifically the way that he looks non-white. He is in various moments described as animalistic, which even today is how non-white people are spoken about in order to justify racism and atrocities against them. Various people say he looks like a gypsy, which is obviously a degrading word for being Romany. His own son describes him as looking like a sullen savage with a kind of rough beauty. Honestly, growing up, I always thought that Heathcliff was some kind of mixed race person because the commentary of like, no matter how hard he tries, he's never gonna fully fit in, you know, very relatable to me. When I was researching this video, one character says that he might be a little Lascar or like a Spanish castaway. Um, Lascars were sailors or militia from predominantly India. And actually, as I know, because I was just in that area of India, it's where my family is from, um, Portuguese ships employed a lot of Goans on their ships because Goa was a Portuguese colony and, you know, Portugal's right next to Spain. Heathcliff was picked up in Liverpool, which is one of the big port cities. Uh, and Nelly describes him as not being a regular black and says, you're a f you're fit for a prince in disguise. Who knows, but your father was an emperor of China and your mother an Indian queen. So Heathcliff's descriptions are deliberately made to be ambiguous. Although quite honestly, he could be going in some way, shape or form. I, that would be amazing. But like at the end of the day, I don't think you, you, I think you are deliberately not supposed to know where he's from in terms of like his ethnicity. What's important is that he's treated differently because of it and he doesn't fit in and he will never fit in. People have suggested like casting like Dev Patel, for example, or Luke Pasqualino. Uh, personally, I'd love to see unknown actors being cast in this because it's Wuthering Heights, it's Emerald Fennel. You don't need well-known names. People will see it based on that alone. And like, especially if the actors are really good at their roles, it can be breakout roles for really, you know, up and coming actors. Which brings me to Margot Robbie. I love Margot Robbie, can I just say that? She's a phenomenal actress, she's a producer. I think if you've seen her performance in Mary Queen of Scots, you know that she can do period dramas, you know, it's a historical role, I thought she did it really well. I don't think she has an iPhone face necessarily. However, she is wrong to play Kathy. Kathy needs to be very young. She needs to be able to play a teenager and potentially a young teenager. I'm sorry to spoil it for you, but Kathy dies young she dies when she's like 18 and 
that's the part of the tragedy of her character arc is that she was so young. I love Margot Robbie. She is a beautiful woman, but that it is that is just the problem. She is a woman. She's 34 years old. Uh, she cannot convincingly play a teenager and you cannot convince me of that. And this Wuthering Heights is essentially about that first generation anyway, like a bunch of teenagers running around being stupid. Um, so both of these characters are incredibly miscast. Uh, I also want to talk for a second about Gothic literature. In the Oxford Companion to English Literature, uh, in Gothic literature, which Wuthering Heights is a part of, the characteristic theme is the stranglehold of the past upon the present, or the encroachment of the dark ages of oppression upon the enlightened modern era. This theme is embodied typically in enclosed and haunted settings such as castles, crypts, covenants or gloomy mansions, in images of ruin and decay, and in episodes of imprisonment, cruelty and persecution. Gothic is used to describe, you know, barbaric medieval settings because Protestantism and Reformation equals Enlightenment and Catholics are beasts and bad. Um, it's very revisionist. Um, Charlotte, as we know, is not exactly subtle with her anti-Catholicism in her books, especially Villette, but that's like another issue. Uh, but yeah, the Gothic heroine is a very well-known archetype, a very particular type of heroine who stands contrasted to her environment as a way for the reader to kind of see the world through her eyes. She is young, naive, tender-hearted, in some kind of tragic situation, normally with a horrible father and a dead mother. Very young female protagonists are used to contrast with the darkness and death. And Kathy being very young is very, very important for the Gothic tradition of the story, as well as being accurate to the book. So, you know, as we know, Kathy isn't always tender hearted, but I don't want to spoil too much. I also want to talk about Emerald Fennel for a second, because I actually think she is the perfect director for this book. Um, Saltburn wasn't the kind of eat the rich story that people um, wanted it to be, or some people thought it was, um, but a cautionary tale of the dangers of the upper tea middle class who secretly want to be the upper class and covet those riches and houses, etc, 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 which I didn't dislike. I think it's a very apt way of the way that the upper class view the middle class in Britain. I think it's very apt that a section of middle class voters in Britain will vote conservative in this country um, because they are under the mistaken impression that they are closer to the 1% than they are to the working class or they believe that they will be the 1% in the future. Um, so they vote against like their own interests and the interests of the majority of people in the country because one day these poli policies that are gonna, uh, you know, that are making the 1% richer are gonna benefit me. Spoiler alert, the 1% stay the 1%. They don't let the drawbridge down and they're never gonna accept you. Um, sounds kind of familiar, I think, when talking about Heathcliff. As we know, Emerald Fennell is from this world. Her father is a very famous jewelry designer. She went to a posh boarding school where Kate Middleton went. Um, Tatler documented her 18th birthday. I did not know this. Um, Tatler, if, for those who don't know, um, if you're not British, Tatler is like an, a high society magazine. It's for really, really posh people. I mean, aristocracy went to her birthday party. This, it's like kind of gossip girl level. Um, that's just a little context, don't get me wrong. I think she's an amazing actress. She's a, a great director. And I mean, for God's sake, Killing Eve season two, I thought that was really good. She show ran that. And I think Saltburn was very, very visually stunning. I like, haven't seen Promising Young Woman, which is her first film, but from what I've heard, revenge is pretty much an important theme of that film as well. So based on her previous work, I'm confident that from a filmmaking perspective, she will bring out those themes. You know, I, I was like, she's gonna do great until I saw this casting and I'm like, mm, maybe not. Um, accurate casting is crucial for bringing out the themes of this book. And if this is the final casting, I don't think I'll be watching personally. So now it's time to roast Netflix. By now, we all know that they have announced a adaptation of another classic of Gothic literature, which is The Picture of Dorian Gray. Um, the series is gonna be called The Greys. It's set in a modern day beauty industry and it's centered around siblings, Dorian and Basil. That's right, siblings. Now, Oscar Wilde is probably one of the most famous gay men in history. Picture of Dorian Gray is his most famous work and Wilde spoke about the inspiration coming from having his own portrait painted by a friend. In December 1887, I gave a sitting to a Canadian artist who was staying with some friends of hers and mine in South Kensington. When the sitting was over, I had looked at the portrait. I said in jest, what a tragic thing this is. This portrait will never grow older and I shall, if only it was the other way. The moment I had said this, it occurred to me what a capital plot the idea would make for a story. The result is Dorian Gray. Fun fact, Dorian Gray and The Sign of the Four, which was the second Sherlock 
Sherlock Holmes book were commissioned at the same dinner by a magazine um, editor who in I think August 1889 or something he basically had a bunch of writers and he was like I want to commission something from you and the sign of the four was like published very soon after and it took I think seven months for Dorian Gray to like appear but then it was featured in the magazine and that was its first publication in April 1890 according to my notes um so the picture of Dorian Gray is full of homoeroticism I don't think you can deny that in any way shape or form um Dorian was potentially named after the Dorians of ancient Greece who were an ethnic group and they were first mentioned in the Odyssey in terms of like the historical record uh living in Crete and basically the Dorians and the Ionians are the two groups who are fighting in the Peloponnesian War if you are a fan of history. Spartans were Dorians, for example, uh, Corinthians were Dorians. Uh, Wilde was a classicist, he studied classics at university, very well versed in ancient Greek culture. Uh, as we know, the assumption in ancient Greece that everyone was pansexual is actually not that far off from the truth. Um, the phrase, well, for men anyway, the phrase Greek love is sometimes used as a code for a gay relationship, uh, sometimes more specifically as a word that I cannot say, and I'm gonna have to look at my notes for a second as I say this, pederasty. For some reason, I always say something else. Anyway, I hesitate to get into this because you kind of have to explain it in context of ancient Greek law, uh, military service, society, and culture, and this isn't the video for that. Um, but it's basically when like a, a dominant, active, older man the Erastes was in a relationship with like a beautiful, uh, passive, younger man or boy, the Eronymus. It was considered like a coming of age ritual and like Apollo and Hyacinth are an example of this archetype of pedastery in Greek myth. So in the context of Dorian Gray, Dorian is like the Eronymus to Lord Henry's Erastes. Dorian is constantly challenging Victorian ideas of masculinity in this novel. It was heavily inspired by himself. Um, Oscar Wilde wrote in a letter that the picture of Dorian Gray contains much of me in it. Basil is what I think I am. Lord Henry, what the world thinks me. Dorian is what I would like to be in other ages, perhaps. Some reviewers were so shocked by the book that they said Wilde should be prosecuted for violating laws regarding like public morality and decency. While they criticised the novel for being like effeminate, contaminating, and the homoeroticism was picked out as being like out of step with Victorian values. He ended up taking out the more like obvious examples of homoeroticism in the 1891 like edition of the book when it was published. Um, at this point in 1891, Oscar Wilde had been having relationships with men for about five years. Um, his first relationship was with Robert Ross. And it, that year, 1891, was also the year he met Sir Alfred Douglas. The relationship that would define his life, um, they quickly became really serious. Wilde was infatuated. Lord Douglas was reckless, which is not a winning combination for two gay men in Victorian England. Douglas helped introduce Wilde to like the world of prostitution, which Wilde kind of entered into as a form of pederasty. I actually said that right that time. Um, so, you know, whining, dining, etc., etc. Um, so Lord Alfred Douglas's father, interestingly, was the Marquis of Queensbury, which if you are a fan of boxing, the Queensbury rules, that's him. He did not get on with his son and he had confronted his son and Wilde at various points. In 1893, a 16-year-old had confessed to his parents that he had been with uh, both Robert Ross and Lord Alfred Douglas and solicitors were involved, parents were persuaded not to press charges because as being part of the relationship he also would have been criminally liable. So this relationship between father and son, Lord Alfred Douglas and his father, very strained. One day in 1895 the Marquis of Queensbury left his card at Wilde's club uh, with the note for Oscar Wilde posing sodomite. This note changed the course of Oscar Wilde's life forever. Oscar Wilde sued Queensbury for libel. The note was basically a public accusation of sodomy. Um, he goes with Ross and Douglas to a solicitor and he directly lies to the solicitor and says, no, I haven't been doing sodomy, which like also what, what else was you supposed to do really? <laughs> Queensbury was arrested for criminal libel, which could have got him up to two years in prison and to be found innocent, he had to prove that it was true and there was a public benefit 
to him openly saying it. This was basically the first celebrity trial. Queensbury's private detectives were digging and they, you know, made their way into the underbelly of Victorian London. They find out about him going to the gay brothels. They find out about his friendships with, you know, lower class younger men. They are also feeding this information about Wilde and Douglas's relationship to the press. So this is huge. The trial begins and Wilde is asked many things about his life, about letters he sent Lord Alfred Douglas, which he declared to be works of art, um, which he was unashamed of. Um, blackmailers had tried to sort of get him for that in the past. Fun fact, the judge in this case went to university, to Trinity College Dublin, where he went before um, Oxford, to at the same time as Wilde. So kind of a conflict of interest, methinks. Wilde also claimed at one point, very interestingly in the trial, is that works of art are not capable of being moral or immoral, only good you know, only well or poorly made, which I mean, he ate with that, not gonna lie. But the, the reason I'm bringing this up is that bits of Dorian Gray were used in the trial as evidence against Oscar Wilde, Lord Henry's speech to Dorian. Um, the judge accused Wilde of like depicting Dorian being corrupted by Lord Henry's like philosophy of life. Obviously there's so much more to talk about in the trial, but this video is not meant to be about the trial. Um, go look that up, it's fascinating. Uh, but basically Wilde is all about kind of style over substance. He cares a lot about how he's perceived his public persona. So he would say things because they sounded good, despite the fact that they were incriminating him. He wanted to be in the newspapers and he didn't really think about the implications of this. Um, his dedication to aestheticism was unwavering, like right from his university days to his death. While it was responsible for his infamy, it was also responsible for his downfall. Basically, Wilde ended up dropping the case. Queensbury was found not guilty. And not only did Wilde get bankrupted because he had to pay for the legal fees of Queensbury, but the accusation that Wilde was a sodomite had effectively been proved true in front of the world because of the details that had come out about Wilde's life during the trial and via people's testimonies. And so a warrant for Wilde's arrest was put out on a charge of sodomy and gross indecency. And gross indecency was essentially like anything gay that wasn't actual, you know. And in that trial, the jury was unable to reach a verdict, but the judge was the one who sentenced him, um, convicted him, two years hard labor. Uh, so we have established how important the homoeroticism and undertones of Dorian Gray are, and the sexuality of Oscar Wilde himself. So I wanna have a look at that press release again. Um, it's a modern remake. We are expecting for there to be deviations in the plot to account for this. It also means that the homoeroticism in the show is likely to be overt and not, you know, um, it's hopefully gonna be part of the plot. And Basil is gonna be the straight brother and Dorian is gonna end up being gay or chaotic bisexual because TV. Uh, there is no mention of who's going to play Lord Henry, so we are working on very little at the moment. Um, in the book, Basil is obsessed with Dorian um, to the point that he sees him as like an idol of sorts, and the friendship and love between them is never explicitly sexual. But you, if you are in any way queer or read queer literature, Obsessive friendships are very much a stop on the road towards questioning sexuality for many people. The protectiveness that Basil exhibits towards Dorian as he tries to keep him from Lord Henry, very jealous um, when they're spending time together. Again, like there's nothing explicitly sexual about it, but like the words are there in the novel, they speak volumes. And writing at a time when homosexuality was illegal, this was as close as you could get to insinuating that there was more than a friendship between two men. And that's just on the 1891 version of the book. If you look at the the version that was published in the magazine, it's so clear. Um, a conversation between Lord Henry and Basil goes like this. Tell me more about Dorian Gray. How often do you see him? Every day. I couldn't be happy if I didn't see him every day. Of course, sometimes it's only for a few minutes, but a few minutes with somebody one worships mean a great deal. But you don't really worship him. I do. <laughs> I'm so sorry, I'm not an actor. Basil also talking to Dorian, he says this. It's quite true that I have worshipped you with far more romance of feeling than a man should ever give to a friend. Somehow I have never loved a woman. I suppose I never had time. Well, from the moment I met you, your personality has had the most extraordinary influence over me. I quite admit that I adored you madly, extravagantly, absurdly. I was jealous of everyone to whom you spoke. I wanted to have you all to myself. I was only happy when I was with you. When I was away from you, you were still present in my art. You never would have understood it. I did not understand it myself. One day I determined to paint a wonderful portrait of you. 
It was to have been my masterpiece. It is my masterpiece. But as I worked at it, every flake and film of colour seemed to me to reveal my secret. I grew afraid that the world could know of my idolatry. I felt, Dorian, that I had told too much. If that reads as just friendship to you, I do not know what to say. So either they are gonna water down that relationship to make it a sibling one, or we're getting some kind of Game of Thrones type shit, which like, I don't fancy either scenario, to be quite honest. I can't see them not featuring Lord Henry, and I don't doubt that that relationship is gonna be very significant, but the relationship between Basil and Dorian as artist and muse is so integral to this book. It is a massive mistake to water that relationship down. In the modern day as well, that obsession would play out so differently on screen and it would be so engrossing. And it would have been quite great to see that with like the ad, you know, increased technology, the stalking, the obsession, like it, it would have been horrible to watch, but it would have been incredibly intriguing to see that play out. And again, I don't think I'm gonna be watching this show. I wonder, like, that's a big question that I would like to ask. If you're a fan of either book, um, are you going to be watching? If you are not a fan of either book, are you going to be watching? Like, I just want to know everyone's thoughts because this is a very um, interesting topic. The topic of adaptations is something that I hold very close to my heart and I think I'm going to make a full video about adaptations and how to make a good one. So if you want that, do let me know. Thank you for watching. That was a little look into my feelings about media literacy. Uh, interpretation of themes and media and how that plays into book adaptations specifically. I hope you enjoyed it. If you made it through to the end, thank you. If you liked it, do give it a thumbs up. And you know, like I said, I make videos all about books, history, culture, etc, etc. So do subscribe if you would like to and let me know if you'll be tuning in. Happy reading.